a religion is just absolutely uncalled for. We're, we are just mere things floating on a rock in space. We are not only figuratively, but literally stardust. You don't have to go to church on Christmas, and it is about being good, and that's what all religions are about anyway. Are you an atheist? Yeah. Kill yourself? Yeah, I'd like to. So you're an atheist? Yes. I need to know what to believe in. Like what happens when you die? Yes, I don't want to be a bag of dust. David, are you an atheist? Yes. When did you become an atheist? Uh, around age 12. Believing in God makes no sense. It, it's, to, to me, it's the dumbest thing. It's, it's, it's for people that can't accept the fact that they're going to die and rot in the ground like I'm going to do, and, the, and it gives them some relief from, from that thought because it's not the nicest thought in the world. Are you an atheist? Yes. Yes, I am. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Are you an atheist? I am. But yeah, I'm an atheist. Uh, yes, I am. Alex, do you believe in God's existence? No, I do not. How long have you been an atheist? I would say probably since I was about 15 years old. So you don't believe in the existence of God? No, not really. What happened when you were 15? Um, I started questioning things, and I really just started to think about the logic behind everything. For the most part, we are not shown the evidence for there being a higher power. If we were, I almost guarantee that almost every atheist would immediately agree to there being a higher power. Are you atheists? Yes. Yes. Why? Um, well, I just haven't seen enough uh, evidence, I suppose. I grew up in a Christian family, and just over the few years d during high school and as I grew up, I just realized that there wasn't a lot of evidence to support that belief system. Are you open to evidence? Um, I, I think I am open to evidence. It just would have to be extraordinarily compelling, like out of this world compelling. If you could be given evidence, reasonable evidence, would it? Would you listen to it? Yeah, I would. You're someone who has no faith or no belief in a higher power or a creator, but if you were shown evidence, you would change your mind because you're open. Absolutely. Flick through the pages of the book I just put on your lap, look at the color pictures, and I'll ask you a question. Do you believe that book could happen by accident, that nothing produced the color pictures in the book, that red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet ink fell from the sky and formed itself into those beautiful pictures, and then black ink fell from the sky, or from nowhere, and formed itself into coherent words and sentences, capitals and periods and commas, making sense, page numbers fell from the sky, all in order, and then it bound itself and formed itself into a cover with artwork, and there we have a book. Obviously, intelligent design designed the book. Wouldn't that be correct? Yeah. Can you see where I'm going with this? Yeah. Tell me, what is DNA? What is it? Deoxyribonucleic acid. And it's what makes up our bodies and our cells and everything that makes us who we are. DNA is like our biological code, kind of like binary zeros and ones. Information about us, who we are, what makes us us, parts of us, how we look, um, how we're built, everything like that. Your genes instructed your cells how to make your eyes and what color your eyes should be and your hair and your height and your personality. Scientists call it the instruction book for life. Basically. Everything that you are or ever will be made of starts as a tiny book of instructions found at each and every cell. Every time your body wants to make something, it goes back to the instruction book, looks it up, and puts it together. The book of you would have 46 chapters, one for each chromosome. Each of our book's 46 chapters is between 48 and 250 million letters long. That's 3.2 billion letters total. This is the secret language of DNA. 
This is the book of life. Instruction book for life. Yes. Instruction book for life. Yes. DNA is made up of genes, and genes give instructions to the cells as to how your body should grow. Did you know that those instructions, the instruction book of your DNA, just your DNA, was laid out end for end, would go to the sun and back a number of times? That book of instructions is so comprehensive. DNA is the genetic information encoded in the cell of every living thing that instructs our cells how to grow and how to function. It's our genes that determine whether our skin will be dark or light, have brown or blue eyes or red or green or yellow, have red hair, be brunette or blonde, be tall or not so tall, or the color of our feathers if we're a bird. Whether we're humans, fish, animals, insects, or plant life, the way our bodies look and operate has all been pre-written in the amazing book of our DNA. What do you think the mentality of someone who believes a book fell together without a bookmaker? Uh, well, they would be crazy. Do you think a book could make itself? No, I don't. Of course not. No. Utterly impossible. Yes. <laughs> if anything can happen by accident. I mean, from nothing. Um, wow. Well. Couldn't happen, could it? I don't think so. It would be impossible. It would be like saying a, a, an explosion caused uh, everything that makes a 747 airplane to all just come together by accident without some, without some intelligent thought behind it. That's, that's a good point. Do you believe DNA happened by accident? No, I think that it developed over the course of many, many millennia of evolution and development. DNA exists in every living, every living thing. Its origins don't matter. The fact that there is intelligent information tells us there must be an intelligent designer. Is this making you think? It is, and I, I do think about it from time to time. It's just... Yeah, it's, it's complicated, definitely. Well, it's, DNA's complicated, but the point I'm trying to make is very simple. Book, book designer, or bookmaker, DNA, intelligent designer. God. Does that make sense? Yes. You an atheist? I am. What would you think the mentality of someone who thought a physical book could make itself? Oh, I think they'd be silly. Of course it can't make itself. What would you think of the mentality of someone who believed the instruction book for life, DNA, made itself? Uh, well, I think it'd be silly as well. It would need investigation. That's atheism. Absolutely. And what would you think of the intelligence of someone who believed the instruction book for life made itself? Low, low intelligence level. DNA happened by accident, um... Probably not too smart. <laughs> DNA couldn't make itself. It's impossible. Does that make sense? Yes. Is this making you think? Yes. <laughs> and what would you think of the person who believed that DNA, the instruction book for life, happened by accident? Because we're not just talking about human beings. We're talking about every form of life. Fleas, cats, dogs, elephants, cows, horses trees, plants, everything has DNA, the instruction book for life, which makes the book in your hand just seem feeble compared to the infinite intelligence that must have put the instruction book for life together. Can you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Do you believe DNA happened by accident? Uh, I believe it could. I... Explain it to me, how a program could make itself out of nothing on how to make a human eye, giraffe's eyes, elephant's eyes, Cats, dogs, puppies, flowers, birds, trees, every living thing has DNA that's so complex, it's mind-boggling. It must have been a genius beyond any human reasoning that put it together. And to say it happened by chance is infinitely sillier than saying a physical book happened by chance. All I'm doing is reasoning with you. I'm not argue I don't want to win an argument. I'm just saying I want you to concede something that's absolute common sense. You're an atheist, so you believe the scientific impossibility that nothing created everything. I mean, it can't be nothing. We all have to start from some point. I wouldn't say nothing created it. There had to be something there in the beginning. You like Richard Dawkins, don't you? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, yeah, I like him. Do you believe nothing created everything, a scientific impossibility, which is what he believes? You don't believe in a creator of all things? If he says that, I think it's a very strange thing to say. Well, he says it. It's insane. Nothing can't create anything because it's nothing. It has to be something in the beginning. Nowhere in our history of, of human reality has something kind of just appeared out of nowhere. Do you believe that nothing created everything? 
Uh, no, because nothing can't perform actions. That makes no sense. It's a default position. If you're saying nothing created everything, then you're agreeing with Richard Dawkins. You're mischaracterizing Richard Dawkins because Richard Dawkins, I'm sure he didn't say that. That seems ridiculous. Professor Richard Dawkins, arguably the world's most high-profile atheist, believes that in the beginning there was nothing and that nothing created everything. As he attempts to justify this belief, admitting that it defies common sense, the learned professor calls nothing something. Watch the reaction of his audience. Of course it's counterintuitive that you can get something from nothing. Of course common sense doesn't allow you to get something from nothing. That's why it's interesting. It's got to be interesting in order to give rise to the universe at all. Something pretty mysterious had to give rise to the origin of the universe. Which is exactly what, what's meant by, by nothing, but whatever it is, it's very, very simple. And <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> Well, I think it's a bit funny to be trying to define nothing. <laughs> Richard Dawkins, I'm sure he didn't say that. That seems ridiculous. The audience reaction confused the normally eloquent professor because he's not used to being the object of laughter. What he didn't realize was he was talking to people who were endowed by their creator with the virtue of common sense. This was just another case where the emperor has no clothes. Someone should tell this man who has deceived millions, you're talking foolishness. Is that what you believe? I mean, it can't be nothing. We all have to start from some point. But there has to be something that created everything. You just, just wasn't God. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. It's just evolution, how things became from one organism into many. But that doesn't solve your dilemma of the initial cause. There has to be an initial cause. If there was a big bang in space that from there issued cats and dogs and horses and cows, the sun, the moon, the stars, the seasons, and all this marvel of creation came from a big explosion, what caused the explosion? And where do the materials come from, from the explosion? And why is there such incredible order from the explosion? Every explosion I've heard of creates chaos, not order. That makes sense? Oh, yeah. This is what you're looking for if you were looking for truth. This is your information that you need to say, wow, that's logical. How could all this design from the atom to the universe, an incredible order just happen by accident? Because an atheist actually believes nothing created everything, which is scientifically impossible. And I'm trying to say, Haley, I just want you to think. You're not just a blob of nothing, but it came from an explosion that created order, which is against nature. That means that you've got purpose and meaning in the universe. So it's not altogether bad news. I just want a relationship with whoever built me. This is too much, too weird that it happened by accident. It didn't happen by accident. I don't feel that. In June of 2016, I interviewed theoretical physicist Professor Lawrence Krauss and asked him the same questions I asked the university students. I was limited to only asking questions, but he was very gracious and it was an honor to meet him. Lawrence, why are you an atheist? Well, you know, I, uh, I don't call myself an atheist uh, any more than I call myself an a-leprechaunist. Uh, uh, in fact, I don't label myself as is. I, I, the only ist I might use is a scientist. And that's really important to me because as a scientist, I don't accept things without evidence. And, uh, and there's certainly no evidence for, for God. And, the, and all the stories about the different gods, as there have been thousands of them, all seem equally ridiculous. At least millions. Yeah, probably at least millions. Are you open to evidence? I'm absolutely open to evidence. In fact, I change my mind all the time. That's the great thing about being a scientist. Unlike religion, we don't assume we have all the answers. In fact, we ask the questions, and we let nature tell us the answers. I know you picked up this book before. Do you believe this book could make itself? That it, let, me, let me give you this scenario. That ink fell on the pages, colored photos just manifest when ink fell out of nowhere. The sentences became coherent with periods and commas? Uh, no, but no, which is one of the reasons why the way that the Bible was written by humans, because it didn't make itself. There were some bunch of largely literate Iron Age peasants who, who were trying to understand the world and didn't know much about science, and they wrote in different forms, books, and, uh, okay, so the, the, you know, fourth the, question. could a book arise spontaneously uh, from nothing? Absolutely. But could it make itself? That, no. There's two very different things, because you're implying design, intent, etc., which is what, of course, you do. DNA is called the Book of Life. Could 
DNA make itself? Well, see, that's where the question is, is, is ridiculous, because in fact, DNA doesn't make itself any more than a snowflake makes itself. A snowflake is a beautiful, beautiful thing, and, and it's assembled by nature. It doesn't make itself. It's the laws of physics and chemistry, polar molecules, that make this incredibly complex, beautiful structure. Now, the same thing with DNA. DNA is an amazing structure, and the laws of physics, chemistry, and ultimately biology, but which derives from that, will in principle explain how DNA uh, first arose. You give me the laws of polar molecules, and I'll give you a snowflake. There's no intent, no grand purpose, no, no design behind it. Even though they look designed, the illusion of design is an illusion. Natural law does indeed produce complex structures like snowflakes. But the law that produces that kind of complexity is simply the same chemical reaction repeating over and over. That is not information. What's stored in the DNA molecule is specified information, like the information found in a book or a computer program. The fact that a book requires an author and a program requires a programmer is not an illusion. It is factual as seen in the real world around us. It isn't apparent design, it is real design, as any college student can tell you. Do you believe the instruction book for life happened by chance? No. So it couldn't happen by chance, could it? No. So where did the intelligent information to selectively arrange the building blocks of DNA come from? That know-how and forethought does not exist in any of the materials from which life is made, and the laws of nature have no purposeful capacity to write a book or arrange its pages. So where did that specified information come from? Its origin is certainly supernatural. What Professor Krauss completely overlooks is the external nature of the information encoded into the DNA molecule. A complete set of software instructions directing the formation and reproduction of human beings, both male and female, and all other living things. Bill Gates once said, DNA is like a computer software program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? I'll have to say the chicken. The chicken. What do you think? The chicken. Chicken. Chicken? Chicken. And what about you? The egg. Egg, okay. Was the egg fertilized? Uh, you got me. <laughs> you got me, yeah, ain't no way. Maybe God created the chicken, so then that's how the egg came. You got me, I don't know. I, I didn't think that far into it, I guess. Maybe most likely the chicken, I would say. So if the chicken came first, it then laid an egg. Okay? Was the egg fertilized? Down now. The egg. The egg? Yes. This chicken that produced the first egg, was the egg fertilized? Mmm, it, it would have to be. So there's a rooster. So there was a rooster. So there's a rooster and a chicken. Where do they come from? Uh, they all came from the stars. You said, I am, we are stardust. Yes. What does that mean? For me, the most astonishing fact is that the molecules that comprise our body are traceable, are traceable to the crucibles of the centers of stars. And we are not only figuratively, but literally stardust. Okay, so where did you come from? Uh, I came from the stars. No, no, you came from your parents. <laughs> Obviously I did, yeah. Where did they come from? And they came from their parents. And where did they come from? From their parents. Right back to Adam. Correct. Adam was created by God, and he made male and female, and he made the birds of the air and made them male and female so they could reproduce after their own kind. Okay, explain this to me, if you really believe in evolution. Before it had eyes, how did it see? Um, the eyes have to evolve, because the thing's evolving from stardust. Correct. Um, so they probably didn't see, they felt. They felt, did it have a brain, or couldn't have had a brain until the brain evolved? So how did it think to look for food? And where did the food come from? And why did the food evolve? And did it have lungs? Do you think the chicken thing before it evolved into chicken had lungs? I'm not too sure. It's all about a uh, uh, survival instinct. So, you know. It's not going to survive. It didn't have lungs. And 
If it breathed air, was the air 20% oxygen as it is now, and why did the air evolve? And why did it evolve lungs? And how did it survive before it had lungs? And see before it had eyes, and think before it had a brain, and eat before it had an appetite? doesn't really make sense when you think about it because you've got to translate that to elephants, horses, cats, cows, human beings. Every living thing that apparently evolved from stars had to evolve eyes and ears and a mouth and a nose and lungs and heart and kidneys. Let's go back to something more simple regarding that first chicken that came from the stars. Which came first in the chicken? Was it, was it its blood or its heart or its blood vessels? Which evolved first? I do not know the answer. Well, if it was the heart, why did the heart evolve when there was no blood? If it was the blood, why did the blood evolve when there was no heart to pump it around? If there were no blood vessels, how did the blood get around the body of the chicken to keep it alive if there's no heart to pump it? I've always had the doubts. It's like, we've been here for how long and we still haven't evolved, or what are we going to evolve into? Can you think of anyone that isn't fully evolved? Anything on Earth. Dogs have four legs. They have a tongue and eyes and ears. Everything's fully evolved. People have, they don't have half evolved leg. You don't see someone with a semi-evolved leg or half an ear or half a nose, half an eye, half teeth. Everything's fully evolved because the Bible says when God created all things, it was finished. So everything's finished. The fruits, the flowers, the birds, the trees, the nuts, the, the giraffes, horses, cats, cows, everything is fully finished. And what it does is disproves evolution and establishes the Bible in saying that God created everything fully finished with the ability to reproduce after their own kind as male and female. La France de Charles Trenet, c'est la France de tous les Français. La France rêvée, la France passée, mais jamais oubliée. C'est la France de notre enfance qu'on a gardée dans le cœur. Douce France de nos vacances qui a le parfum du bonheur. C'est le pays où la mer, avec ses reflets d'argent, danse le long des golfes clairs sous les ailes. As was a Do you think God exists? Um, a designer? I'm, I'm open to the idea, of course. You trust your eyes? To an extent, yes. Is there such a thing as a sunrise? No, it's an illusion. We move, and thus given the illusion that the sun moves. So there's no sunrise, no sunset. Don't trust your own heart, because your heart, your eyes will tell you there's water on the highway on a hot day. You'll see it shimmering. What do you stop? If you wash it, clean your teeth, or have a drink, it's not even there. Your eyes are lying to you. Any sleight of hand magician will say, don't trust your eyes. And the Bible says, he who trusts his heart is a fool. Do you believe in God's existence? Um, in a sense, I guess. What sort of sense? I, I would say that there's some kind of governing unity that binds humanity and such. But I don't think of, uh, I guess, a divine leader or something like that. God itself can't be described as, as a person or a being. It, it, it's more of a, it's more of a uh, all-encompassing energy, if you will. Yeah, like an energy drink. Yes, absolutely. You are a moral being. You're not like a dog or a cat. You care about justice and truth. That's why you're upset about little kids getting killed and molested, because you're made in God's image. If you were a dog, you couldn't care less. But you're, you're created in God's image with a knowledge of right and wrong. The, the reason most people aren't Christians is because of what's called idolatry. They've got a wrong concept of what God is. Take Richard Dawkins. Have you heard of him? Of course, yes. Richard Dawkins is not an atheist. He's an idolater. What an, what an idolater normally does is pick out the, like, treat, treat God like a buffet. When you go to a buffet, you take the nice things, the sweet things that you like. Well, an idolater normally says God is merciful, love, and kind, and they just create a false God with no sense of justice. Richard Dawkins, instead of doing that, he goes through the Old Testament and takes the judgments of God, the wrath of God, and he creates a monster with no sense of mercy or justice. Richard, you, in your books, you, you've been pretty scathing about <laughs> the God of the Old Testament. Um, let me just quote you, if I, if, I, if I may. The most unpleasant character in all fiction 
misogynistic, homophobic, racist, genocidal, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, and you go on. To argue for intelligent design is one thing. To use it as evidence of the truth of Christianity is another. Have I given you something to think about today? I would say you have. It doesn't change my viewpoint. This has given you something to think about. Uh, but I don't believe in God or the Bible. Do you now believe in God? No. So you're still an atheist? You still think the book made itself? Are you now no longer an atheist? Um, uh, yeah, I, I still am. You're holding on to the yeah. book made itself? Why would you do that? Are you no longer an atheist? Um, uh, I, I would still go on as an atheist. You know in your heart God exists. I know you know for many reasons. One was, I'm like you. I was running from God, from God too. And two, the Bible says, God has given light to every man. And when you put that light out, when you dull that conscience and you're in a knowledge of God's existence, Jesus said, when that light is put out, how great is that darkness? You're like a man who takes the batteries out of a smoke detector because he doesn't like being alarmed by the smoke detector. And all he's doing is doing himself a tremendous disservice because when he goes to sleep and there's a fire, there's nothing to warn him. And you're going to go to sleep without that conscience telling you what to do because you've dulled it. You've taken the batteries out. And I'm saying, let it be renewed today. Stir up your conscience. Think about your mortality, your death. When the Bible calls an atheist a fool, it doesn't mean a clown or a court jester. When it calls him a fool, it's, it's because he's denying the inner light that God's given to every man, the knowledge of right and wrong. It says, their foolish hearts were darkened and they embraced a lie rather than the truth. They believed a lie rather than the truth, which is what atheism is, it's a lie. I'm giving you evidence and facts. Just as a physical book by logic and reason has a maker, so the instruction book containing infinite wisdom and intelligence and instructions beyond any human comprehension is evidence of the existence of an intelligent designer. But the reason you want to fight it is the same reason a thief doesn't want to find a policeman. You, the last thing you want is God in your life because you love your porn, you love your marital sex, your fornication. In a sense, I'm preaching the choir because I know that you know the Creator exists. The Bible says you're given the truth by God, but you suppress it in unrighteousness. You hold it down. Every single one of us know that there's a Creator, but we don't know the truth of Christianity, and that's, that's what we're called to do as Christians, bring the truth of Christianity. So how you can live forever. This Creator became a person and made it so you can have everlasting life if you're interested. If you're not, it's your choice, but I know that you want to live. So the argument for intelligent design isn't to convince people of the Christian message. It's just to show them the insanity of atheism. Isaac Newton said, atheism is so senseless. It's the father of science. And it is, it's senseless, because you're given senses. Seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, and smelling. Think of your taste buds, how incredible they are. Sitting there waiting for food to come, and they all rejoice and leap for joy when there's good food and gives you pleasure. And Think of what you're able to look on the flowers and the birds and hear the birds in the morning and see the trees raising their arms in praise to God and the blueness of the sky and the warmth of the sun. That sun is 93 million miles away. We're spinning in space, 1,000 miles an hour, round and round. We're going through space at 63,000 miles an hour, and that sun is sending rays 93 million miles, and it's just warm enough to ripen your tomatoes. This is very clear evidence. It's like there's nothing to think about. It's either nothing made everything or something made everything. Some things made everything, not something in particular, not one, like, uh, not one specific. Thing. Do what you're trying to do. You're trying to get away from moral responsibility to God. That's really your argument. And that's what the Bible says. There has to be an intelligent mind beyond human reasoning to put DNA together. Does that make sense? It makes sense. So why can't we make the leap from there across to saying, yeah, atheism can't be true? Um, I don't know, <laughs> to be honest. I'm not really too sure. Examine your motives. There must be a hidden motive. Let me see if I can guess what it is, okay? See if I can put my finger on it. If you acknowledge that God does exist, you're admitting you're ultimately responsible to Him. I'm going right to why, why you've got such a big problem with this. This is so simple. Someone made the book. Someone created DNA. You don't want to say someone who's intelligent because you're into porn, you're into sex with your girlfriend, it gives you so much pleasure and you don't want to give it up. And if God exists, then that's going to put a big wet blanket on everything. 
And that's not an exciting thought for someone who loves pornography and fornication and all the things that come with it, because there's incredible pleasure in fornication and pornography. And so what you do is you deny the existence of God because it gives you license to do those things without a feeling of guilt. If God does exist, well, you're in big trouble. So what you do is deny his existence. Am I touching your raw nerve? Am I close? In a way, yeah. Makes sense? Makes sense. It makes sense. I'm still an atheist. Makes sense. I'm still an atheist. The book made itself. It couldn't make itself. Can you see what you're doing? Yeah. So you're I'm not... lying to myself. Yeah. Say that again. I'm lying to myself. The Bible puts it this way. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deed should be exposed. So, why don't you check your own heart and say, am I really seeking truth here? Or am I trying to run like Adam did from God? You know, because right. it's not, Andrew. It's not only, it's not altogether bad news for an atheist if God does exist. I'll tell you why. It means that you are not just a nothingness that happened because of an accident in space. It means you've got worth. You've got purpose. There's right and wrong. It means there's a way past the thing you have to face. This thing called death that consumes everyone. What do you worry about? I mean, if you, if, if midlife crisis is often like facing death. your own death. Yes. Okay. Maybe you'll go to heaven. We're Maybe you'll all... die and go to heaven. Okay, that, that's why I need help. The Bible says that we're tormented by a fear of death, but we're so proud we don't mention it because it makes us seem vulnerable and weak. It's very rare to speak of this in private, let alone in public. I need to know what to believe in. Like what happens when you die? Yes, I don't want to be a bag of dust. None of us are really sure of anything that happens after we die. Oh yeah, I'm absolutely sure, 100%. 54 million people a year die. A lot die young. And if God exists, then there's possibly a way past death. And I'm saying, man, there is, there really is. What you got to do is get to square one and soften your heart and say, okay, this is evidence. I'm no longer an atheist. Tell me what you want to say. Does that make sense? Yeah. The book that I handed to the atheists is called Made in Heaven, a publication that explores 32 modern inventions whose designs were copied from nature. Among other things, scientists studied the shape of birds to design an aeroplane, the mosquito in creating a syringe, and the earthworm in building the machine that dug the English Channel. In 2015, world surfing champion Kelly Slater and his team of technicians produced a man-made wave. They too copied nature's design. They called it man-made, but they actually used existing water, existing ground under the water, and pre-existing laws of energy to create the wave. It took years for a team of very intelligent designers to create this one wave. Seeing that, I'm 100% positive our team built the best wave that anyone's ever made. It's a freak of technology. Here's their blueprint. The scriptures say that God gave the care of the earth into the hands of mankind, and that he's given us, richly, all things to enjoy. Of course, atheists believe no such thing. They're convinced that all these pleasures came about by pure chance. 
that it was fortunate that after the Big Bang, the Earth just happened to form and began circling the Sun. The gravity also came into being to keep us from spinning into space. They believe it was fortunate that the atmosphere formed itself around the planet and that the Sun ended up at just the right distance to support life. It was also an amazing coincidence that water appeared. And even more miraculously, that inanimate matter somehow came to life. And then inexplicably, that first simple cell reproduced itself and became increasingly complex to create all the plant, animal, and human life we see. They believe it was just happenstance that over one million species evolved with both male and female, each with the corresponding reproductive parts, and that thousands of different types of trees evolved, and not only to furnish us with wood to build houses, but to breathe in our carbon dioxide and breathe out the oxygen essential for our life. What a happy coincidence that cows give us meat, leather, milk, cheese, butter, yogurt, and ice cream and that chickens give us finger-licking good food and protein-packed eggs, and that sheep give us wool and meat. Atheists also believe that it was by chance that there are thousands of delicious plants, fruits, vegetables, and nuts that are beneficial to the health of humanity. How kind God is to give us all these things, and on top of that, to give us the ability and the pleasure to reproduce after our own kind. All the combined atheists in the world shaking their tiny rebellious fists at their creator are together like a minuscule bug on the face of this mass of earth that is nothing but a tiny dot in an unspeakably immense universe created by almighty God. I'm assuming you study anthropology quite well to, to say this. I've heard of an atheistic tribe. They always worship something, a totem pole, the sun, or something, because, because God has given light to every man. That's, that's because we as humans, we try to make sense of things that we don't know. And, that's, and most of the time, that's where we make our mistake. Well, I couldn't say that for them. I say they're making sense of something they do know. They look at creation or nature and know, look at the order of everything. We're on a great big piece of dirt flying through space at 63,000 miles an hour, circling the sun once a year. Seasons come round, winter, spring, summer, autumn, every year. Everything's clockwork. We can predict the sunrise a hundred years from now to the very second because there's such order in nature. You know how many people die every, every year? Millions and millions. <laughs> 54 million people every year. People just like you and me with a will to live, saying in their heart, oh, I don't want to die, I love life. It's so precious. And acknowledging that God exists is the first step in the area. And, and to acknowledge that God exists, you just got to have a humble heart and say, okay, I'm going to be open. You know, the Bible's full of scientific facts that weren't discovered till thousands of years later. I didn't know that. Yeah, it says the earth hangs upon nothing in the book of Isaiah. Okay. It's written 800 years BC, which shows divine inspiration, because how could they know in those days about the earth's free float in space? The earth hangs upon nothing, the earth's free float in space. Wash hands under running water before we understood the diseases, spoke of quarantining, it said the earth is round. It says in Leviticus, the life of the flesh is in the blood. We didn't know that. You give your doctor a, a vial of blood and he can tell you how your flesh is doing, your whole body, tell you what's going on in it, because it's life of the flesh is in the blood. You know something, I don't even want to get any older. I hope I get enough guts to get myself out of this stinking plant. You gonna kill yourself? Yeah, I'd like to. Please don't do that, Rich. Oh, no, no, if I, if I... You've got worth, you've got, you've got worth. There's a reason for your existence. Am I anymore? I can't. I, I... Only as an atheist you believe like that. Creation is enough for you to know God exists. Conscience is enough to know that He requires morality. The commandments condemn you. And the last thing is conversion. If all you have to do is repent, trust Christ and you'll come to know God. And that's the gauntlet I throw right in front of you. I say, Richard, you've got nothing to lose. You're going to die. It could be tonight, it could be tomorrow. Every year, 54 million people die. What have you got to lose but your pride? You think hell exists? No, that I don't. Okay, see if I can convince you of that, all right? If a man raped your mother and cut her throat, he should be punished. He should be. So if you feel like that, where do you get it from? It's because you were created in God's image. God believes in right and wrong. He says he set aside a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. 
Think of a man like Hitler, what he did. He slaughtered 11 million people, 6 million of them Jews. Men, women and children, they were subjected to horrors beyond words. Hell is God's prison, a place where people receive justice without parole, damned forever, which is a terribly scary thought. This is the problem. We find it difficult to reconcile God being good and yet creating hell. How could he be loving and kind and good? I wrote a book called Hitler, God and the Bible, and I studied the Holocaust in research for the book. And I saw things that just made me weep, horrors beyond words. Young girls, teenage girls who were hung by the neck just because they didn't agree with the Nazi politics. They were called partisans. They hung them with thin rope to make it more agonizing. And as they were in the death struggle, there's pictures of Nazis laughing at them as they hung by the neck and died. And I thought to myself, if God is good, how can there not be a hell? There must be punishment for wickedness. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes complete sense. So what are you going to do on Judgment Day? How do you think you'll do? Are you a good person? All in all, I'm a good person. I don't, I don't really lie, cheat or steal, so... You don't lie? You know what, never mind. I'm going to move away from your intellect to your conscience, all right? Okay. Do you think you're a good person? Yes. Do you think you're a good person? If there's a heaven, are you going to make it there? Uh, yeah. If there is a heaven, I hope I'd make it there. Where are you going when you die? Um, I don't know. I believe I'll go to heaven, but... Why would you go to heaven? What did you do to merit everlasting life? That's the question. That's the question. I, uh... <laughs> wow, I don't know what I did. But I do... It must have been pretty big to get everlasting life right right well wow that's interesting that is a big thinker are you a christian uh i'm currently a catholic you've been born again i'm not sure what that means well jesus said in john chapter 3 unless someone's born again they'll not enter heaven so this is real important it's like the difference between believing in a parachute and actually putting one on things are fine until you jump yeah. you know so uh and the bible says put on the lord jesus christ and you do that through the new birth the only way you'll see a need to be born again would be this, probably the same way you see a need to put on a parachute. If you didn't want to put a parachute on, probably the best thing I could do for you is hang you out the plane by your ankles for two seconds. You'll come in and say, give me that parachute. Now, Haley, I'm going to change gears and just talk about the same thing from a different angle, okay? Can you handle that? Yes. Not going to get upset? No. So let's do that. I'm going to hang you out the plane for a second, okay? Haley, do you think you're a good person? I do. Do you think you're a good person? I, I mean, I think so. <laughs> yeah, I would like to think so. I'm a good person. I think I'm a very good person. What about you? Sure. How many lies do you think you've told in your whole life? Too many. <laughs> Plenty of white lies, but I don't think anything serious. I'd say about a thousand. Thousands. The download of music off the internet that's not yours. Um, say from like a website? Um, the, yes. Music off the internet stealing. Yeah, it certainly is. You've stolen something. Not really. Come on. What do you mean, not really? Sort of half a <laughs> half a diamond? You ever stolen something, even if it's small? Yeah. We're all sinners. You've lied and stolen? I've lied, but I've never stolen. You ever downloaded music off the internet that's not yours? Yes. That's theft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've stolen. You've got a multitude of sins. You're just like me. Every thought you've had that's been godless, you've, you've stirred up as wrath. Jesus said, if you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Do you know that? No. Do you lust after a woman? Sometimes. Look at pornography? Mm, no. Tell lies? All the time. <laughs> so you do look at pornography? No, I, I mean, everybody does. It's not like it's not like nobody does, but... So you do? Yeah, sometimes. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? All the time. The thing is, about that, I, I, I do have trouble with that with that concept, with that idea, is because this is now no longer a sin of what you do, but rather what you think. It's a thought crime. You think murder, God says you committed murder. You think adultery, you've committed adultery because God considers the, the desire the same as the deed, because he knows you'd do it if you had a chance. Lady next door says, come on over, honey. You'll be over like greased lightning if you've had the opportunity. God knows, he knows the thoughts and motives of the heart because we love darkness and hate the light. You look at pornography? No, I have a girlfriend actually, she'd be really if she found out. You ever look at pornography? Look at pornography. Yeah. I treated yeah. women like cattle. Didn't ask me that at first. You asked me, do I currently? And I said no. You don't need to because you're fornicating. True. Have you had sex out of marriage? Oh, yeah. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes. What about you? Yeah. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Absolutely. OMG.
Uh, then yes. Oh yeah, all the time. It's blasphemy. And Jesus said, if you look with lust, you commit adultery in the heart. Have you ever done that? Absolutely. So, Haley, I'm not judging you, but you've just told me you're a lying thief, a blasphemer, a fornicator, an idolater, an adulterer, and, a, and, and you've violated all his commandments if you study them. So naturally to me. It's exactly what the Bible says. We naturally do that which is wrong. Who made me that way? You can't blame God for your own moral. If he made me with a sinful nature, then how is he going to blame me? It's like, it's like you make a car and it doesn't run and then you get mad at the car. No, it's not, because a car isn't a moral agent. You've been given a conscience. You know right from wrong. Con is with science is knowledge. Okay. So every time you have fornicated, lusted, looked at pornography, lied or stolen, you've done it with knowledge that it's wrong. So, Lee, you've just told me you're a lying thief and a blasphemous adulterer at heart, and that's only four of the Ten Commandments. You have to face God on Judgment Day, whether you believe in Him or not, or now you believe. If He judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, do you think you'll be innocent or guilty? Guilty. Likely guilty. I suppose guilty. I would be 100% guilty. I'm going to be guilty just like everyone else. Everybody does bad stuff, so I would be guilty of those things. Heaven or hell? Hell. Hell? Well, if there is a hell, I would say I would be making my way down there. Hell? Hell. Hell. Does that concern you? Uh, a little bit, yeah. How can he let some of the stuff happen that we wouldn't let happen. We'd go to jail for doing certain things that he lets happen. Why doesn't he have a little more, show a little more compassion? When you look at what happened in Nazi Germany, instead of saying, if God is good, how can he create hell? You've got to come out saying, if God is good, how can there not be a hell? There must be retribution for murder and injustice. And, and the Bible says God is so good, He's going to punish those murderers, but He's going to punish rapists and thieves and liars and fornicators. He's going to punish sin wherever it's found because He's good. The Bible says lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Lying is incredibly, so is blasphemy, using God's name as a cuss word. I would go to hell. Does that concern you? It does, but at the same time, I would hope that if there is a God that he would be understanding that I'm doing my best to try and be the best person I can every day. Well, you've blown it like the rest of us. It's like standing in front of a judge and say, Judge, I raped that woman, but I'm really trying to be the best I can. That, that It's already done. Yeah. The judge is going to throw the book at him. Would you go to heaven or hell? Uh, hell. Does that concern you? If it was real. It is real. I know it's real. You know it's real. God's given you knowledge of His existence. Look at the genius of His hand all around you. Your eyes have got 137 million light-sensitive cells. Human beings can't make an eye from nothing. Just think of the complexity of life. You're not even, control, you're not even in control of your life. Do you realize that? You can't stop yourself blinking, thinking, breathing, dreaming. Your bodily functions happen irrespective of your world. You can't help but go to the bathroom every day. You can't help but go to sleep at night. You can't help but blink and breathe. All these things are set in motion by God, shaped by your DNA, your height, your color of your hair, the color of your eyes, your personality, were all written in the instruction book of life the moment you were conceived. And within that, psyche that you have is a will to live. Something in you says, I don't want to die. You're not an animal. You're not a dog or a cat or a horse. You're a human being made in the image of God with a knowledge of right and wrong, given a conscience by God, which is society shaped, but God given. You know right from wrong. And so on judgment day, you can't say, I didn't know. You're a human being. You're aware of your existence. That's what human being means. You're aware of your being. And so something in you says, I don't want to die. It's self-preservation. The Bible says Jesus Christ has abolished death. Now, if that isn't true, we shouldn't look into it. But if there's one chance in a million that it is, your good sense should just open your heart and say, I'll check it out. Does that make sense? I hear what you're saying. Now, do you know what God did for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Any idea? Um... He... Oh, gosh. I don't think I know. Mm-mm. I, I don't know. No. Would you mind telling me? <laughs> Who can help you? Nobody. Buddhism can't help you. Islam can't help you. Hinduism can't help you. Being religious can't help you. Being good can't help you. You are hopeless. The only thing that can help you is God's mercy, and that was extended through the cross, through the Savior. There's no one on the face of the earth that can help you. 
The Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You have no choice. There's only one parachute being offered, and that's the Savior Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus of Nazareth, perfect sinless man who gave his life on a cross. Now you probably know that, but you may not know the legal implications. God's a judge, the Bible paints him as the ultimate judge, the habitation of justice. You and I are criminals called sinners because we violated his law, the Ten Commandments. We're heading for God's prison, a place called hell without parole, we're under the death sentence, but Jesus stepped in and paid our fine in full. If you're in court, even though you're guilty, if someone pays your fine, the judge can say, well, this person's guilty, but someone's paid his fine, he's out of here, and he can do that which is just. Well, the Bible says God can let you live forever because Jesus paid the fine in full on that cross. When he was on the cross, he cried out, it is finished on the cross. It was his last words. In other words, the debt has been paid. That means God can legally grant you the gift of everlasting life. And then he died and then rose from the dead three days later. And what you have to do to have your case dismissed, to walk out of God's courtroom and be gifted with everlasting life because God's merciful, is repent of your sins and trust in Jesus like you trust a parachute. If you ever jump out of a plane, don't just believe in the parachute, put your faith in it, put your trust in it. And that's what you must do with a savior. You repent and trust in Christ. You don't have to get religious or do good works. It's a free gift of God. And the second you do that, Andrew, God will dismiss every sin, all those secret sins, the imaginations of your heart, those sexual ones you thought no one saw. God saw them and you're stirred up as wrath. If you stand in front of the judge and say, judge, I raped that woman, very serious crime, but I want to tell you, I do a lot of good things. The judge can say, what are you talking about? You're not going to be judged by what you do that's good. You're going to be judged on the crime of rape. You're going to prison, buddy. The judge won't judge you on your good works, and God's exactly the same. Good works are irrelevant. We can't bribe God to forgive our sins and let us live. All we can do is throw ourselves on the mercy of the judge and say, God, forgive me. And the Bible says God is rich in mercy, and He provided a Savior. And He'll forgive you in a second because of what Jesus did on the cross. It's called grace and it's amazing. The Bible says God is rich in mercy and He can save you by His grace, His unmerited favor. He can extend it to you. You don't have to go to church on Christmas and it is about being good and that's what all religions are about anyway. Be a good person. You don't think no. all religions have the thing of be a good person? Not Christianity, no. means, but no. by grace through so, faith. Yeah. What? What? By grace through faith you've been saved. It's called amazing grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. And when you repent and trust Christ, Everlasting life is a free gift and death has no hold on you. See, your beliefs are so imperative. You may not think beliefs are important, but if you're walking along a path and you, you believe there's a landmine in front of you, your belief will govern your steps. If you don't believe, you walk right onto it. So what you believe certainly does matter. And if you believe you're a good person, when you're not, you're a lying thief and a blasphemer, a dull at heart, you won't repent. So that's the basis of all religion. They think they can do something, get everlasting life, face maker, pray, fast, repent, lie on beds and nails. They think they can earn eternal life from God, or merit is, is favor, and yet it can't be done. I just want to say, Richard, I care about you, I love you, I want to see you on Judgment Day on the, in heaven, Not, I don't want to hear of you being in hell. Nothing would grieve me more, because you have a multitude of sins and God's rich in mercy and will forgive you if you'll humble yourself, repent, and trust in Him. Bored in heaven if I make it there. No, you, you see, no. let me tell you, heaven is not people with wings sitting on clouds playing rusty harps. That's ridiculous. God promises we're going to inherit this earth without the Genesis curse. No more earthquakes, no more hurricanes, floods, disease, pain, suffering, and death. He's going to give it to the meek. The meek will inherit the earth. So when we talk of heaven, we're going to have heaven on earth where the lion will lie down with the lamb. The swords will be uh, changed into plowsheds, no more wars, no more murder, rape, kids being molested, no more sin. And you could be part of that kingdom if you repent and trust Christ. And I want you to because I care about you. Okay? Well, why? <laughs> why? I'm a total stranger to you. Why do you care about me? Because I love you. I'm a Christian. I'm not filled with hate like some religions. And this is more serious than a heart attack. So please don't put it off. Just give it serious thought as you lay your head on your pillow tonight. Listen to your heart beat in your ear and realize if that heart stops, you're suddenly in eternity facing a holy God without a savior. You're jumping without a parachute. So I want you to consider those thoughts because there's nothing more important than where you'll spend eternity. My heart breaks for you. You're 18, you've got your whole life ahead of you. You don't know when you're gonna die. You've got temptations everywhere to do wrong and God offers you everlasting life. And the Bible says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Don't put it off because you'll become self-righteous and harden your heart to the Lord. When you're tender and soft, when you're thinking about these things, 
Just cry out to God in, in, in humility and God will forgive your sins in an instant. You don't have to get religious or do good works. It's a free gift of God. Did the information I gave you about DNA make you think deeper? Yes, it did. Absolutely. Are you now no longer an atheist? I suppose when you present to me the, the technical definition, I would say no, I'm open. When you came up to me and said atheist, that's what I identify as, but I believe that there are things that probably can't be explained, and it is possible that, you know, there's a creator. I'll definitely consider this. This, this will leave an imprint in my mind. Um, it's definitely made me think about it. It's been uh, eye-opening. Do you now believe in God's existence? Yes, I do. But have I given you proof today that there is an intelligent designer behind DNA? True, yeah, you did. For lack of a better word, yes, I am no longer an atheist. I'm no longer an atheist. Does this make sense? Yeah. So, Andrew, if you were to die today and God gave you justice, you'd end up in hell. There are two things you have to do to be saved. You've got to repent and trust in Jesus. When are you going to do that? As soon as I have a strong, firm belief and I'm ready to adhere to what God would like me to do. Does this make sense? Very much, yeah. Yes, it does. Yes. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. You gonna think about this? Yeah, I'll think about it. Are you gonna think about this? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It was really informative. Thank you. Yeah. You gonna think about this? <laughs> I, I definitely will. Has this made you think today? It definitely has. It definitely has. I'm glad to talk with you because you, I, I think I'm sure you're a lot more intelligent or somewhat more than the average person I talk to about religion. You're going to get right with God today, is that what you're saying? Yeah. So you, come, you come to the Lord just to apologize for your sins, put your faith in Jesus, and then pick up that Bible and read it daily and obey it, and God will never let you down, man. This is more serious than a heart attack. So. Today would be the day, and please don't feel pressured by me. It's your life, and it's your will, but it's just a matter of saying, God, you gave me life, you gifted me life, I've used your name as a cuss word, I've sinned against you, I've violated your commandments. Please forgive me and transform me and grant me the gift of everlasting life. It's got to come from your heart, I can't pressure you. Does that make sense? Yes. When are you going to do that? Almost immediately. You serious? Yeah, I'm serious. To realize what you're doing, you're, you're giving up your will. You're saying, not my will, but yours be done. You gave me life. I've sinned against you. Please forgive me. And I yield my life to you. Things are going to change from now on? Yeah. You serious? I'm serious. I will take a closer look uh, at God. You really mean that you're repenting of your sins and trusting alone in Christ? Yes, I am. I would like to go to church, actually. So please think about this. Will you at least do that? Sure. Do you have access to a Bible? Yeah. You have over 20,000 on your phone, did you know that? That's, that's a good selection. So when are you going to get right with God? Um, I guess as soon as I can. <laughs> you mean like today? Uh, yes. You realize what you're doing? You're, you're laying down your will and you're saying, God, I'm not going to play the hypocrite. I'm going to repent of my sins and trust alone in Christ. You understand that? Yes. You must repent and trust alone in Jesus. When are you going to do that? Tonight. When are you going to do that? As soon as possible. Like today? Yes. The Bible says today is the day of salvation, so don't even presume that you've got till tonight. You know, just in the quietness of your heart, say, God, I'm a sinner, I'm a rebel. Please forgive me, and he'll do so the instant you put your faith in Christ. That's what a Christian is, someone who's, who's given up the, the rebellion. It says, Lord, I surrender to you, and I'm going to obey and love and serve you from now on. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Can I pray with you? Of course. Father, I pray for Augusto that this day he'll truly repent, be genuinely sorry for his sins and trust in you and pass from death to life because of your mercy. You can't help but blink and breathe. All these things are set in motion by God, shaped by your DNA. Your height, the color of your hair, color of your eyes, your personality, were all written in the instruction book of life the moment you were conceived. Nearly 3,000 years ago, the psalmist wrote that when he was conceived in his mother's womb, before he was even formed, every part of his very substance was written in a special book. 
For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written. Thank you so much for watching The Atheist Delusion. We hope that you not only enjoyed it, but that you see its potential to reach millions with the message of everlasting life. Please take a moment to share this exciting film with others. We've made it very easy for you to do this. Simply go to atheistmovie.com and click Outreach for three things you can do in under three minutes to help get the word out. In addition to The Atheist Delusion, we've produced a very exciting, easy to follow, four session video course that will equip you to do what Ray did in the movie and reach atheists with the love of Christ. This study is perfect for church small groups, Sunday schools, and family devotions. Visit atheistmovie.com to learn more about the video study and also for details about how you can purchase The Atheist Delusion DVDs at a very low cost. Thanks again for watching The Atheist Delusion. Please pray that God will use it to reach billions of people around the world. With Him, nothing is impossible. Don't forget to check out livingwaters.com. Our ministry has other movies, an award-winning TV program, a variety of unique gospel tracts and books, an online school of biblical evangelism, various social media connection points, such as Ray's personal Facebook page, which has over a half a million likes and where he posts and responds to comments daily, and many more resources that'll inspire and equip you as you reach out to others with the gospel of everlasting life.